All right. Great. Um, so I thought I would uh, start by kind of addressing some of the questions you guys had about um, the program assignments and some of the changes that I did. I'm just pulling up PyCharm here so I can pull this out. Yes, uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, if you are here, you can type present into the chat and we'll uh, uh, have that saved. Okay. So um, here's the basic um, kind of issue with the programming assignments. There are two ways of doing that. And um, um, Joe uh, kind of found some good, um, one case that is kind of difficult to implement. This hasn't come up in the past. I ran this assignment for a few years. I'm kind of surprised by it, but I'm glad it did because uh, now we can make it better, which is good. So. Um, there are sort of two ways to, of, of implementing um, this assignment. One is to um, not use threads, which I guess what we've been doing in the past. And you basically need to kind of depart from RDT implementation um, and do something like what TCP does, which is where you're sending data and acts in the same packet. And okay? so I think people have been doing that for a while. That works okay. I think it's I think it's harder than we need to be doing. I think the easier thing to do is to, at least from like a procedural perspective, is to just implement RDT as it's kind of outlined in the slides and, and in the book. The challenge with doing that is that RDT is fundamentally a, a unidirectional protocol. You have a sender and receiver. It's not really set up to be sending data back and forth. Um, what can happen is that you can have a, a confusion in the receiver as to whether or not um, a, a packet is a new data packet or an ACK. And I, I'll, I'm, I may need to throw up a slide to kind of show you guys what, what the issue is. But if you do end up creating two separate um, UDP channels or two separate network channels, one for from sender to receiver in one direction and then from sender uh, to receiver in the other direction, you can implement RDT as it is described in the book as kind of unidirectional protocol. Um, let me see if I can um, throw you throw up a slide that kind of shows the scenario. Um, I was thinking about how to do it. I was trying to find like a virtual. Um, let me share my screen here. Uh, let's just share screen and just share PowerPoint. Okay, I was trying to find like a, um, I guess I should have had the slide made already. I'm sorry, I don't. I was trying to do like a virtual whiteboard thing um, to make it cooler, but there were just some technical issues with that that I haven't quite worked out. So maybe for next time. So, okay, we'll do this on the fly. Um, everyone can see my slide. Yes, let me know if you can't. Um, okay, so what we have is basically RDT um, send on one end. I guess I guess we'll call this um, we'll make this the client, and on the other hand, um, we'll have the server. Okay, so what we have here is RDT send um, and RDT uh, receive. And this basically shadows uh, kind of the main loops of the client and the server process. Okay. Later on, um, and so I guess the direction here is um, basically from here to here, right? And later on in that main loop, what we have is RDT send here and RDT receive on this end with data going in the other direction. Does that make sense to what I'm illustrating here? Okay, great. So in this, um, let me see what 
if I can do this correctly. Okay, so what we have here is data. Um, can I change the color? Maybe not. Okay. Um, shape outline. I don't know. We'll make it uh, make it gray so it's really easy to see. Okay. Um, okay. So what we have here is data going in this direction. Okay. This is basically the descent. Okay. Um, as a result of that, uh, what we can get is an ACK going in the other direction. Okay. And now this ACK can, in fact, um, end up being garbled. Do we have a... Uh, Like a, I need like a failure, failure thing. Okay, maybe I'll grab that. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Rotate. Make it red. Okay, we have a failure. <laughs> so, okay. So as a as a result of this, now we need the we need data to be retransmitted right that's kind of the, the procedure that you would see in, in rdt right and so the send function doesn't quit right until it gets an ack but rdt needs to return so we can move on to sending and so that's why we kind of need a separate thread here to be running to do this to do this receiving so um i guess i can do this okay so this is kind of being received in this. Uh, you can set up a thread. Okay. So this helper thread stays around to basically um, make sure that it will then send another ACK after the data is resent so that send can receive when it when it gets the ACK. Okay. So, so that's all fine. Um, now, when we call receive, the helper thread keeps running, but once the data arrives, receive can kind of return, right? Pulls it off the buffer. And now the server is moving into sending the reply using RDT, RDT send, okay? As a result of that reply, what it's going to get is it sends the data. I guess I can move this up a little bit. It sends data in this direction, okay? And then it gets the ACK going in the other direction. Okay, so if we're running, let's say we don't have, let's say we don't have this um, ACK being sent yet. Okay, so we have the receive helper, which here it's calling UDT receive to get the data, right? Okay, but at the same time, send is going to call UDT receive to get the ACK. And so we have the, the helper thread calling UDT receive to get the data and send is calling UDT receive to get the ACK. And because of the same UDT receive, it's not clear who's gonna pull the data. And if, if this is actually corrupted, okay, there's no telling which thing was corrupted. Was it the data that was retransmitted that was corrupted? Was it the ACK that was corrupted? Um, both of these processes, the helper and send, are simultaneously pulling data of UDT receive and now there's this confusion of what to do, okay? So where this problem is solved is when we can call, um, when we have separate channels for each of these communications. So this is a separate channel and this is a separate channel. And the way I have achieved that, or the way I propose you guys do this is when send calls something, instead of calling network, that uh, which is I guess the UDT 
that UDT that send. I forget the the exact. Uh, let me look up the syntax for this. Uh, yep. Okay, got it. Um, and instead of calling network UDT send, and here network UDT receive network UDT receive. Okay. What we basically set up two separate network connections. Okay, so this one would be called net send UDT send. Okay, which then connects to net receive UDT receive. Okay. And likewise uh, here, we're would, using... Wouldn't that, sorry, wouldn't that be net send? Because it's still in the responding to send? No, no. Uh, no, it would actually be in send functions, we're using network send. In receive functions, we're using uh, net receive. And the way I set it up is by switching the, switching the ports so they can kind of stay together, right? Just to make it easy enough that like, okay, if we're in the sender, we're using this network. If we're in the receiver, we're using this network. Um, and then, so in, in this case, we can use net send UDT receive to get the ACK and uh, yeah, basically that's all you need, right? So in the sender, we're using network send UDT receive to get, to get the ACK and we're using net send, UDT send to send data. Okay, so using the same network functions in both in both cases, send and receive, you just have to switch which channel you're using. And that's the easy way of, I know this looks a little complicated, but it's easy for you guys to do because you don't need to change the finite state machines for receive and send. Um, and they're going to work on a unidirectional level as long as you provide them a unidirectional channel between net send and net receive. The other approach to doing this is to abandon all that, change the finite state machines to look more like TCP, where you are transmitting um, both the data and ACK in the same packet. I think that's actually harder to do, but if you already went down that path, and I know some people completed the assignment using that approach, that's completely fine. You don't need to change anything. You don't need. You don't even need to pull my changes from GitHub. You can revert to the previous kind of the starting point of the assignment and and do that. So if that makes sense to you. If you've already done it, happy for you. Completely great. If you're still struggling, um, or if you're just getting not struggling, if you're even just getting started in the assignment, um, the easiest thing you can do is to just make sure to use this networks uh, class in send and this network class and receive and just proceed as you were going before. This is kind of a scenario that can happen under some corruption patterns if you just get unlucky enough. Uh, and I want to make sure that we have a correct way of, of, of handling this, that you guys can handle that correctly. Um, but it really makes uh, kind of very little difference from your perspective other than this one change in code. So it seems like a big change. Um, and it only has to do with one corner case, uh, but from your perspective, hopefully not much changes in terms of your design. I'm ready for questions. Um, I had a question about how, how to kind of, like what part of code are we blocking off for the thread? Um, because in the um, D2L announcement, I think, um, mm -hmm. You were saying that um, the helper function essentially would um, just collect things to the buffer, and then the receive function would just um, use what's already in the buffer. Mm -hmm. um, but how, in that case, would the receive function know either way to respond with another sending more data if it if like it seems like the ACK or NAC got lost. If, Great. Because mm -hmm. the thread is the one that keeps running in the background, but that's only taking care of the buffer. So how would, 
if, if the receive function has already returned already, then how would action be taken? Right, the send function would would not return. So let me show you. Let me show you guys the code. That's this is a great question, by the way. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have it. Uh, let me change my sharing. Let's share something else. Um, you guys can see my code, yes? Great. Okay, so we have client and we have server. Mm -hmm. server uh, can't see, I got too many things on top of it. Okay, I think this is the server. Okay, okay, now I see the tab, great. Um, okay, so what's happening here is that we have the send and then we have receive, but what we really care is the send. And now what we care about on the server is the fact that it starts with receive. Okay, so receive has a helper function that runs in a loop. Send doesn't return until it's satisfied that it got an ACK. Okay, so you can send that packet goes into receive helper. Receive helper kind of runs the FSM state and keeps send resending the ax as necessary until send is satisfied that it got the ax and then send can receive and this code can move on. Receive on the other hand, or the server on the other hand can call receive starts the, uh, you know, you can start it, you see the receive thread, the receive helper thread, you can start it kind of earlier on. You can start it you know, at, at this point when you're creating the, RD, the RDT object. And then the receive just pulls it, the data from the buffer. So send sent some data and it got here successfully. Receive can return that message and then that message can be processed. In terms of what that looks like in our diagram, um, share content. I'll just share my screen with you guys. That'd be easier. in terms of what this looks like is you're calling send here. That send doesn't return until it successfully gets an ACK, okay? So if this, if this is our pattern of interaction where we send some data, there's an ACK being sent back by the helper thread, okay? That ACK is corrupted, okay? So send says, I didn't return. I don't know, I didn't get an ACK yet. I'm going to basically loop and send data again. Let's say, that data uh, is gets here, and now there's an ACK that's being sent. At this point, let's say this ACK is not corrupted. Send gets that ACK and says, okay, now I can return. And the client process moves on to the rest of its code. Okay. So the helper thread basically stays around to keep retransmitting ACKs. When the ACK eventually gets through, send can return. Um, so then that, that receive helper threat, it gets started mm -hmm. once and then it just uses the same one because there's no way to determine, right, when receiving ends for that specific message. Correct. Correct. So there's one, good question, there's a one receive helper thread and gets started at the beginning of the process. Um, you can start it in, when you start the RDT object and you can stop it when you call RDT disconnect. Oh, okay. I was thinking it was getting called by RDT receive. It, it, it's it's not. Um, you can do it that way, and then it can stay around, right? Because you can just start the thread at some point. Um, but you can start it earlier. You can start it when you create RDT. You can start it when you call receive the first time. Um, but yeah, it sticks around, right? Because there is no way for the thread to know when it's actually done. Just like there's no way for receive in the first place to know when it's actually done, when send is satisfied.
Um, just a small follow-up to that. I know that the initial base code on the RDT, RDT receive end mm -hmm. um, had the re return string um, essentially like there's this like if statement that uh, return string equals p message if return string is none otherwise it's return string plus p message um since now the receive function doesn't really know that doesn't have that loop of like um adding up the buffer because mm -hmm. that's delegated to the helper do we just mm -hmm. ignore that part or yeah, you could you can move this part to the helper thread, um, and basically receive would just return whatever the helper thread co collects in the buffer, which is not different from what we're doing in the network function under uh, under collect. So this is kind of the thread that keeps running and collecting data, and then you can see that UDT receive basically just pulls data from that buffer. Um, yeah, I was just referring not to the buffer itself, but to the um, message string that gets returned. Okay, um, maybe I didn't get that, the question quite right. Because um, that still gets returned by the main receive function, correct? The message, yes. Okay, um, so at the, I think it was the end of the original, um, near the end of the original uh, receive function, um, mm -hmm. it it adds up whatever it's, it's accumulated already with a new message. Mm -hmm. So can we ignore that part since every time RDT receive gets called, it's just going to put everything that's in the buffer. It, it can't just like keep on adding because it's not calling um, the receive portion of it, if that makes sense. So, okay, the reason, we're, the reason we're doing this part is that what we're, getting, what we're getting out of UDT receive is just bytes, right? And it's, it's not always clear that we're getting out of the network enough bytes to have a whole message or have a whole packet, um, right? You could be sending a 20 byte message but you call udt receive after only five bytes have made it across the wire right if your timing works out that way and so what rdt 1.0 does is it collects these bytes that are coming out of udt receive and essentially aggregating them into into messages um, and if there is a message, it will it will return a message or uh, potentially multiple red messages. I guess that's possible in here, I think, as well. Um, so instead of returning these uh, messages here and here, um, it could basically move them into a buffer. So if this is the helper thread, it could move these messages that it aggregates into a buffer, and then UDT receive could pull those messages from the buffer to return them to the application layer. Does oh, that yeah, make I think, sense? I think so. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Do you have Do you have a follow up? I want to make sure that I didn't uh, do a proof by intimidation here. Um, no, I, I think I'm understanding the concept. It's just I've had difficulties getting it to work. Um, it just kind of seems like once it hi hits like a couple of errors, because of the two threats, everything just goes out of sync. And then it gets stuck in this infinite loop where like the sequence numbers don't match. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure I'm doing something else wrong. So <laughs> um, you shouldn't have a problem with sequence numbers because Um, okay, here's, here's why I kind of easy way of explaining this, right? So what you have is send, right? And send is not gonna return until that message actually gets through. Okay, so that's one sequence number. Like you can basically, um, the, the reason, because this function is blocking, kind of locks you into doing one thing at a time. Okay, 
Um, yeah, so anyway, we can, I can talk, um, I guess I don't really understand your sequence number problem. Maybe we can look at it later um, if, if there's a specific question. Yeah, I just wanna say one thing, you guys. Um, I, I, I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll make your life easier because you don't know this, but this is this is the hardest assignment of this car, of this course. It, I promise you it gets easier from here. It gets a little weird because you guys had a tough assignment in the first and now there's this one and most of you are probably just like, oh my God, where is this class going? And it is going uh, it is going down the easy ramp from now on. So once you get through this one, the other ones are gonna be uh, significantly easier and you're gonna be like, ah, oh, that makes sense, this is fun. So this is the hard one. After that, it's easy breezy. Anything else? I think the weirdest part about it is that a lot of the concepts just feel so easy, but it's like just so, and I, I don't know, it's still strangely intricate. And so half the time you feel like this should work and then you're not really sure why it doesn't. And I don't know, it's, it's kind of weird. Yes, definitely. Writing, writing protocols is very, is, it, it's hard. <laughs> Um, and it's hard because it's a lot of, you have to visualize the scenarios that are happening, right? Kind of like, like what we did here. So you can write a message sequence diagram like this and say, okay, what are the scenarios? Where, what is this, you know, as this scenario is happening, where are my finite, uh, finite state machines, right? Which state they're in, what are, what is going to be their next action, right? So if you see your finite state machine base on kind of your debug output going to something you didn't expect, right? Um, you can say, okay, let me try to recreate this scenario. Um, that can help, it's not easy, but it's structured. Um, finite state machines are structured. If your implementation follows those, you'll have a much easier time reasoning about your protocol. Um, debugging these things is hard. Uh, you can look at packet flows and timestamps and try to kind of, you know, capture some data on, on, a, on a network and based on that, try to draw the sequence diagram to see what can what possibly happened in that particular interleaving of events. Um, this is very difficult because there's just many, many cases. Um, but also if you're implementing a network protocol or a distributed protocol, that's, that's what's happening, right? There's no, um, there's kind of no way out of it. Right, it's it's just it's just complex because there's timing, there's different timing of events, and there's different states of protocols, and they don't exactly always go in lockstep. Right, you kind of need to have messages that force this lockstep progression. Um. So, yeah, I know it's I know it's hard. I've seen previous classes struggle with this thing immensely, um, but it is it is a good thing to go through uh, because it actually builds a lot of network connections in your brain, which is really what this is about, right? It's just getting you to be able to work with these types of implementations. All right, that's my rah rah speech. Other questions? I have a very quick question. Uh, what probability of corruption should we aiming for? Like what is low enough, high enough? Because. Good question. Um, I would say something that is high enough that you can observe it easily but not so high that every single packet is corrupted. That, that will, can make it more difficult for you to debug what's going on. Because then pe people are just sending stuff kind of rat, you know, back and forth all the time because everything's corrupted. Um, I don't know, 10%? I think that's what I kind of usually test on. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so I'll be more specific. If you can pass, if you can record a video at 10%, I'm happy with it. I'm not gonna crank it up to 99 and see if like your thing collapses. So if you can put enough like duct tape on it to hold on a 10%, you're, you're good. Anything else, anybody? Okay, great. Proud of you guys for persevering. Um, let's move on to some material then. Slideshow, great. Okay, so 
the next thing I want to talk about or tell you guys about is network address translation, which goes along with the idea we covered previously, um, which was kind of which was DHCP. And the idea there was to say, let's say we have a slash 24 network with only 256 addresses, and now we want to um, deploy a network for 500 employees, but we realize that not all these employees are going to be on at the same time, and so we can kind of uh, have them timeshare the IP addresses that we have available in our subnet. Okay? But what if you only have one IP address, like at home, where you buying your uh, internet connectivity from Charter or CenturyLink or whoever, and you get one IP address and you want to have more than one device inside your computer, right? Um, they all need to share this one IP address and the question is how can they do it? So here we have a scenario where we have a, uh, your public IP address might be something like this, um, and that's your the IP address of your router connected to your modem, right, or just your router that's kind of, you know, has a built-in Wi-Fi radio. And inside your home network, you're going to have multiple computers. They're probably starting at something like 192.168.1.1. Okay. That's sort of a, a reserved IP space for, um, for uh, LAN subnets. Okay. Um, or it might be something if you're at the university that starts at 10.0.0. something. Those are kind of the two prefixes that are served for internal networks. Okay. They're not given out to any ISP in that sense. And so maybe you configure a slash 24 network inside your home. And so everything can kind of start with 192.168.1.1. Okay. And so now you have these machines that want to make a request to a server um, in the internet with this IP address. So cool. Um, your first machine, that one, that one, opens a connection on with from port 5000 to this IP address on port 80, maybe this is the web server you want to you wanna connect to. Okay. This packet then goes to your NAT, and the NAT rewrites the source port to something else. Okay. So to this web server, it looks like the packet request is coming not from port 5000, but from port 6439. Okay, that's cool. The server doesn't care. It sends a response. It sends a response um, from port 80 to port whatever. Okay, and now when the packet gets to your NAT, the NAT says, oh, in my entry table, in my translation table, when I send this packet, I put this entry mapping this IP address, the local IP address, port 5000, to um, the, my public IP address, point, port 6439. So now, when the server replies to your public IP address, port 6439, the NAT can look into this table and translate that to that one, that one, port 5000, rewrite that data in the IP packet, and then send it onto the internal network for this server to, re for this client to receive. Okay, so pretty ingenious. We're just rewriting port numbers and using the port numbers to map back to uh, clients within our internal network. You can say how many simultaneous connections can there be, right? Because um, we may have another request coming out from this uh, machine to some other server. Okay, so this will create another entry in the table, or we can have requests going from another computer to one to somewhere else, creating additional entries in this table. Now, what we're fundly, uh, fundamentally remapping or, or using in this table is these random ports that are used as source port addresses. There is a limited number of ports. Port number is a 16-bit number, so you have over 60,000 simultaneous connections that uh, can be going through a NAT. Right, so there's still a limit, but 60,000 is like a reasonable number that mostly works okay. Questions? Cool, great. Right, so if that, that one, that two wants to connect, it will basically get a, a different port number um, on its, for its outgoing message. So now let's say that you want to run a 
a web server in your in your local network how can an outside computer get to traverse your NAS to find a server here okay, and there are basically three ways of doing that okay. um, this is called the NAT traversal problem and it works as follows you have some machine in the internet that wants to connect to a web server that you're running behind your net and that web server is on on a local ip address okay um, one thing you can do is you can statically sorry when i move the some things around i kind of lose focus okay on the on the slides so what you can do is you can statically log into your nat and configure um, a mapping such that any packet coming to port 80 to your public ip address will be automatically routed to let's say port 80 on this machine okay so anything coming into port 80 will be routed here that allows you to run this kind of one um, uh, server on port 80 on your ip address okay you can't run multiple port 80 servers or advertise them on a on a your public ip address port 80 um, you can only have one, but you can configure a static mapping on your NAT. The other option is to um, use Internet Gateway Protocol, which is something that your server can do to kind of autom automatically talk to the NAT um, to set up this configuration without you having to log into the NAT. Okay. Um, and so basically what you do is you can ins your server would install an, an entry in the NAT table um, with uh, some lease time for how long um, this entry should exist for incoming traffic to be routed to it. Okay. The other thing you could do, and this is used in peer-to-peer in -peer systems such as Skype, is to traverse a NAT using proxy to create peer-to-peer -peer connections. So for example, in Skype, right, you want to call, you want to talk to somebody else, some other specific machine, and ideally you would have a direct connection uh, for the traffic. All right, the way this works is that we have two machines. This one here, actually, let me get my um, laser pointer. Okay, we have this machine and we have this machine and they wanna to talk to each other. So the way to establish this connection is from this machine, we're going to traverse the NAT to a Skype server, to a Skype super host, okay? So we do this mapping where we contact, let's say this, this machine on port 80, or some other port that's used for Skype, and we know that this message is coming from uh, dot 95, which is our public IP address from port 6439. Uh, this is the rewritten port um, by the NAT. Okay. Skype contacts this other machine and tells it that uh, the calling client is on port 6439 at this public IP address. Okay. And now this machine can basically call that public IP address here by sending packets to port 6439. And now the NAT will say, oh, actually, well, I was calling this node, but I don't, that doesn't matter to me. Some other node is replying to port 6439, and I have a mapping for 6439 to go back to this machine. Okay? So even though the original NAT mapping was made this machine, this machine tells this machine about the mapping, and this machine can now send traffic directly through the NAT to this host. Because this mapping, the, the NAT mapping already exists. Um, how long does that mapping stick, stick around? Does that also have a time limit put on it, or is it just for every single time it resends it, it establishes that? Yep, there are some there are some leases, there are some lease times, but as long as this traffic is coming in uh, and this mapping is being used, it will it will stick around. I was just curious because um, I was just thinking that if the lease time ran out for one port ID and then the other one was still sending it to it, could you have um, data sent to the wrong wrong port, or was that? Uh, to the wrong, yeah, it could be sent to a different machine on the on your local network. Absolutely. Is that like a security issue potential, um, or? Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, like I'm saying yes because anything <laughs> can be a security issue, so I can't say no. 
Like, yes, you're <laughs> getting a packet that you didn't request. So what does that mean for security? Uh, certainly information leakage. Um, but yeah, you're getting, uh, you know, I like to think of it more as like, it's possible that, that the node that originated the mapping went away. There's a new node that kind of refreshed the mapping or just, you know, kind of collided on the old mapping. And there's a packets being sent to it that it didn't request. That's literally what's happening. Um, what are the implications of that? Kind of really depends on what that receiving node will do with the packet or what wasn't that packet, right? Um, so, yeah, I can just I can just talk about the mechanics of it. Yeah, but that's a good but that's a good question. Like, yeah, that's what happens, right? There's there's some like there's some execution of the protocols or some set of events where this weird thing happens, and it may be completely benign. It may be an issue. It may be it may be a possible thing you could exploit by stealing a mapping, for example, right? If you can hack a math to uh, change the mapping in there to send you the traffic, like, yeah, you can see what other people were, were discussing, right? Of course, these packets should be encrypted as well, so you probably won't have that much use out of uh, getting an unsolicited encrypted packet. Yeah, good question. Anybody else? Cool. All right, so then we move on to IPv6. Um, and it's basically a newer IP format. Um, the idea there was that the 32-bit address space um, has been already given out, mostly to rich countries, and other countries also wanted in on this crazy internet thing when it was starting. And so we needed a different IP protocol that allowed more hosts to be part of the of the internet, of the network. Okay? Um, there were also some lessons learned from the original IP protocol design, and so they were incorporated into IPv6. Um, and interestingly enough, there were also changes to facilitate more quality of service. If you guys remember when I talked about the IPv4 packet, I said, well, there is this type of service field, but it's sort of not used anymore, this was a mistake. Well. Uh, instead of doing away with it because it wasn't really used in IPv4, uh, ITF doubled down on it. Uh, but it doubled down on it in kind of a different way. So it's not meant to be quality of service internet-wide. IPv6 is just a more general protocol where quality of service can be used more effectively inside data center networks or kind of more private networks or inside uh, cellular networks. So. The original reason for having quality of service on internet-wide basis is just as wrong as it was, but they kind of doubled down on quality of service within private network deployments. And I swear this will make more context when we talk about quality of service later on. Okay, so what's happening in this? What's happening in this packet? First, we have version number, which is basically four or six. Here we have six. Um, um, we have. Shoot, I am forgetting what pre is. This is totally embarrassing. Uh, dang it, okay, I will have to get back to you on this. Um, we have a flow label, which is um, the uh, quality of service labeling uh, that I just talked about, basically more bits than we used to have, uh, which allows for a very large number of kind of flow classes. Right? Um, we have payload length, which is basically how long this packet is. Um, we have the next header, uh, pointer, okay? So what I mentioned to you guys is that in the IP packet, in IPv4 packet, we had all this header stuff and then we had options. And you could pass all kinds of things in the options. And this made the processing of IP packets kind of more work than it needed to be on routers in terms of hardware. So what IPv6 headers did is said, okay, you can put whatever you want as the next header. Um, it's we're just going to point to it. So we can say next header starts here, and then next header starts here. Okay. So instead of having like a one header that's complicated, you can just basically say, hey, there's another header to this. And then the routers can process this header, or if they want, they can then start processing the next header, or some other uh, network hardware can decide to look at the next header, but they don't have to. Right? If they want to do things fast, they can just look at this, uh, just at the standard header. There is a hop limit, just as an IPv4 
four, which is how many hops you can. Price stands for priority. Thank you very much. Thanks for someone looking that up. Um, I am forgetting though. Let's see. Do we have more information on priority? Um, I need to look it up. What it really means, why it's used here, um, as opposed to just flow label. I thought that quality of service was just controlled by the flow label. So I'll need to get back to you guys on how priority interacts with this. Um, thanks for looking that up, though. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so this is actually kind of fun to do this in this live way. Um, okay, so Jason says, thanks, Jason. Yeah, let me expand this. Um, so the forward field is similar in spirit to the type of service field so in IPv4. Okay, so we have for congestion and for non-congestion control traffic, such as constant bitrate and real-time traffic. Okay, so it's similar to the quality of service um, classes that we kind of talked about in ATM, and we'll come back to um, quality of service, diff serve, things like that when we talk about um, POS. Uh, specifically when we talk about multimedia traffic. So, okay. So I guess there's a correspondence between the priority field in IPv4 and IPv6. Additionally, we have a flow label, um, which can be used to label different different uh, flows also for quality of service. Um, and then finally, 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 we have the source address and the destination address. And now those, instead of being 32 bits, they're 128 bits, which is far more than, um, obviously far more than 32 bits can allow, such that basically every grain of sand on earth can have its own IP address if it needed one. Um, so there's an interesting thing about these addresses that, that we'll kind of come back to when we talk about um, ethernet. So we are running out of um, IPv4 addresses, but we're not running out of um, MAC addresses yet because those are those have been based on 48 bits, so there's still quite enough of those left. Okay, um, and then finally we have the data. So we have a 40 byte header that's constant. Okay, um, options like in IPv4 are still allowed, but they're going to be in the next header field, simply pointed to by by this. Okay, there is no fragmentation in IPv6. You basically, if you send a packet that's too big, you're gonna get a a message back saying that the packet was too big. Um, it cannot go through the network. You will need to resend it. Okay. So the last thing in the minute I have, I want to talk about approaches for um, building IPv6 into the internet that is essentially built on IPv4. Right. When we talked about um, the early history of the internet, there was this flag day where everything was basically switched over from earlier protocols onto uh, TCP IP protocol. Um, but it would be impossible, it was possible to kind of shut down the internet when there were only a few hundred nodes. It would basically be impossible to shut down the internet now and say, okay, from tomorrow, everything is running on IPv6. Right? So what we needed is a gradual way for deploying IPv6, for basically switching out old IPv4 routers into IPv6 routers. And there's two approaches to this. One is to have a dual stack approach where you're forwarding data from some, on some routers from A to F, and then you're hitting this dual stack uh, router, which says, okay, but the next router on this path is going to be IPv4, so what I'm going to do is to take this IPv6 packet and basically convert it into an IPv4 packet, and then it will be converted back to an IPv6 packet. Okay? The problem there is that you are losing some IPv6 specific information. And so this, this works, but you lose things like flow label. Right? On the other hand, there's this tunneling approach where you your packet gets to an IPv6 router, it is configured to know that it's connected to IPv4 router, so it'll take this IPv6 packet and put it inside an IPv4 packet, which then is routed through the IPv4 network. It gets to another kind of uh, uh, IPv6 router that's connected to this tunnel, which now knows to extract the IPv6 packet from within the IPv4 packet and forward that on. 
Okay. So this is kind of an earlier approach. Now we have this uh, tunneling approach and slowly, 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 um, the IPv4 only routers are being replaced with uh, IPv6 routers. So um, in the rest of the world, this is happening more quickly than America. In America, we have this, these healthy IPv4 networks. And so uh, this is kind of one area where America is actually technologically behind the rest of the world. Okay. Um, I have another thing I wanted to cover today, but I'm two minutes over, so I will not. We'll get to it next time. Um, let me know if you have any questions. I'll kind of stick around for a few minutes if anything else comes up. Um, otherwise, please remember to write present into the chat so I can record your uh, attendance. And uh, I want to wish you guys a good weekend. I will talk to you on Monday. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Hey, Dr. Witty. Yep. Hey, are uh, the, the classes were posted for this next semester, but I didn't see that uh, like distributed uh, uh, yes. course. Yes, um, still working on it. So um, what's happening is actually kind of cool. I'm trying to see if I can pull it off in that I have a, a friend who is teaching a very, very similar course. She's, she's also in the process of planning it right now, uh, Transalier Polytech. So uh, we're kind of working the same area. And so I was chatting, hey, I want to teach this course. And she's like, I want to teach this course. So we're collaborating on how to design it jointly. Um, she has slightly different expertise. So this will be kind of fun. And okay. we, wanna, we don't know to what extent we can co-teach it because it's like, you know, administrative stuff, but at least the courses will be pretty similar. So I'm hoping like within the next week or two, I'll, I'll get this thing pushed through and you guys can start signing up for it. Oh, sweet. Yeah, I was going to sign up for the advanced networking class, but. Yeah, I was looking for that one as well. Uh, sounds really interesting. All right, thank you. And Joe, I want to thank you for um, your help on this assignment. This has, <laughs> been, this has been a pain, but I am really, really glad that we did this because, you know, there was like a kind of a, a, a bug, a poor definition of the assignment that I had for three years. So I'm very glad to have fixed it. Did so you happen you. to look back at other like last classes solutions, like how they got around it? Um, yeah, basically a lot of people use the, the, uh, sending the act in the, uh, along with the data. Um, yeah. I talked to one student who did it in this class and it's, it's possible. It, it works. Um, yeah. The reason I don't want to do it is because it's, it's, it's not the assignment. I want the assignment to be better defined and just stick with, stick with RDT and not say, Hey, you guys have to do RDT, but really you have to kind of move beyond those finite state machines that I give you. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Talk to you later. Bye.